this is very uh, company to company, even organization, even with the large corporation with multiple views and uh, multiple business unit. My personal preference, I would like to have most, if not all, the diligence team become the integration team. Sir. But in reality, that's not always the case, sir, because resources within the corporations. At least you have majority of the diligence team become the integration team, sir. So they will own what they discover and how they will translate that to the integration, sir. We are live from New York out of VRC Valuation Research Corporation's office. They're sponsoring our space to host this podcast today. Welcome to M&A Science, where we curate knowledge from the best in M&A to continuously improve. If you're interested in keeping up with the latest from M&A Science, subscribe to our free newsletter at mascience.com. Every week we share highlights from our interviews, invitations to events, new M&A role openings, and other resources as we build the greatest community of forward-thinking M&A practitioners. Again, that's mascience.com. I'm your host, Kisan Patel, CEO and founder of M&A Science. Joining me today is Andy Vijaya, Senior Director, M&A at KLA. KLA Corporation is a capital equipment company that supplies process control and yield management systems for the semiconductor industry and other related nanoelectronics industries. Traded on NASDAQ under KLAC. Today we're going to talk about how to manage deals from strategy to closing in M&A. Andy, how are you doing today? Pretty good. Thank you, Kisan, for having me. Um, hey, thanks for taking the time to chat. Can we kick things off with a little bit about your background? Sounds good. Sounds good. So um, I do have a different background, somewhat, I would say somewhat unusual for a technical PhD uh, to become an m and professional. Um, like I say, maybe I can break it down to a um, couple of things, both on the educational and the career side. Right? So on the educational side, somewhat straightforward. Right? Uh, study chemical engineering, both for my uh, bachelor and PhD. There are a few, I would say minor twists. I did minor in finance, uh, at the time, the MIT Chemical Engineering Department required all PhD candidates to minor other than chemical engineers. So I, I would say a decade later, it's proven to be useful for my career now. So, And I also did uh, some uh, I was a professional certificate on decision analysis and venture investment kind of stuff. Um, so all I know is mostly technical educational backgrounds on the education side. Career-wise is kind of, a, um, I would say the boilerplate is, uh, you know, from the clean room to the boardroom in the last uh, decade or so. so. What I mean by that is that um, uh, from billions of nanoscale manufacturing in the clean room, it's probably heard on the news, uh, silicon fabrication, and all the way to the uh, sort of decision billion of dollar decision making in the boardrooms. You know. Now, obviously, in between those two milestones, right, I do have ten plus years in the R and D technical product experience, and also ten plus year on the strategy and M and A. So. I somewhat managed to structure my career especially on the high tech to kind of see the, what I call the three major technology stack. Um, one is the silicon, sorry. All electronic devices run on the silicon. Then, to, then the second sort of a, a, a stack is device levels. When you actually build a device, smartphone, laptop, server. And the third stack is basically the software, the apps that you install on the device. So I had the opportunity to kind of go through, um, see different stack on the technologies, right? 
granted, sir, right? no one know everything. If someone tells you they know everything, it's naive, sir. Right? You can only see a slice of a few things, so you get a bigger picture. So. On the on the strategy and M and A's, right? In the last ten years or so, uh, I think it covered a lot of uh, a lot of grounds, from you know cumulative forty plus billion portfolio management, hundreds of the deal pipeline, direct exposure to forty plus deal, leading the team to twenty plus deals, right? and across fourteen different countries, right? Global experience and stuff. So this kind of cover sort of my career wise, how it moved from the technical to the um, business side. Yeah, you got an interesting back background. I, I don't know, Andy, if I should refer you to as a hybrid engineer M and A person. I'm curious if there's any specific things that come from how you learn to think through problem solve in the engineering that you apply in the M and A. For sure, I think um, obviously engineer is very uh, methodical, so right? very structured and stuff. And I think also for someone that built a career through a specific industry, when you can see the breadth and the depth across uh, uh, across certain industries, right? in my case, the high tech. So naturally, you probably develop a certain ability or capabilities. Right? One one of the things that I like to say is that your ability to zoom in, zoom in and zoom out. Right? What I meant by that is that you, you will have the ability to balance a big picture thinker so, and then a, a detail oriented sort of multitasker. So, being able to go uh, do the details and also on the high level uh, conversations. So. In one meeting, you probably work with HR going through compensation. In the next meeting, you'll talk about uh, high-level indirect strategic value with the management. So, so being able to zooming in and zooming out in any different conversation, um, you'll you'll get that ability. So. And over time, given your experience, you probably build some capacity sort of to handle very complex problems right? and be able to um, sort of translate that to a simple framework about influence or decisions. Right? In other words, I would say your ability to filter the noise, because right? you, you, you have seen uh, uh, the bigger picture, you have seen the details, so you should be able to filter some of the noise, what's important for decision making. So, right? It sounds like two different parts, the zoom in, zoom out. And within that is creating these frameworks to filter the noise, and make better decisions. So I think one of the challenge in the, um, in the m and uh, professionals, right? There are, I would say, 1001 problem from the beginning of formulating a deal to the close and fully integrated. Mm -hmm. So at any given time and any given day, you probably have many different problems right? you need to be able to quickly structure those challenges or problem get it to conclusion very soon right? before the next problem come up so you need to be able to listen to your stakeholder synthesize their inputs right and then kind of structure the discussion and framings what are the options right? what is the uncertainty and get uh this stakeholder to converge to some sort of decisions. Otherwise, you will never solve all these problems right? because there's so many one Z to Z that keep coming up uh, throughout the uh, uh, the deal process. Right? All right, let's go through this a little bit because I'm interested. The zoom in, zoom out thing, I'm familiar with it. I'm personally not very good at it. I can do a click down and that's about it. I can't really zoom down to those granular levels of detail, yep. which it sounds like you in some ways are wired to do that, but how, teach me, how, how would I be able to learn to do that properly? Different people ha handle this differently. So some people I've seen, I've been in the much bigger corporation where there are many m and deal leads. So each people handle uh, quote unquote, a deal or project differently. Some just want to 
manage up, so just handling at the high level. Some I don't like this term, but some someone like me like managing down and managing up. Basically, manage your team and manage your stakeholder on the upper management. So, so if you're gonna go through managing your team and uh, on the detail, you should be able to hands on. So, for example, in some of the discussion, you may actually have to open an Excel and do uh, how do you distribute how do you distribute, for example, retention bonus. So, it's tricky. Um, uh, your HR partner will help you, but but some degree, since you're the deal leads, you know where the boundary is. You know where the employee on the other side. Uh, they do. They uh, your HR partner will probably need your inputs right, to drive uh, the appropriate level of a retention bonus, for example. So you go down to the detail. You may actually work on the Excel, right? and then then be able to up level what you work on, and then get the approval from the uh, the management side. Right? Uh, some like it top down, so right? you consult with the um, with the management and just sort of hey here's the top down direction, just work on it. So right? Sometimes you also have to work on bottom ups, so right? based on what you know. How do you want to structure some of these uh, challenges, right? Down to the working on the Excel, those kind of stuff. So it depends on the naturally how you work. So right? uh, do you only want to sort of a uh, uh, on the high level, uh, managing up, or do you want to go through the detail, have some influence from the bottom up? What are other examples of zooming in? Because sometimes I hear about people that go personally have conversations with customers and, and things of that sort. What are good examples of these areas that you do zoom into that do create an immense amount of value? Yeah, so I think one of way, um, one example of zooming in. So, right? so let's say you have a deal. One of the big deal thesis is a product integration. So let's say maybe make it easier the software. So, so you go through due diligence. Right? You see, uh, you look at, you have your technical partner to look at, for example, um, the quality of the codes. Right? Are they? Do they have any open license that they actually do, uh, open source uh, code that is not? They don't have the license. Right? So you go through the detail, making sure you guide your technical folks understand what are the risks on some of this product, and also help your uh, technical partner to frame what would they want to do with this product. Right? If the deal thesis is hinge on the uh, product strategy you kind of have to frame and drive the discussion what is it that you want to do. So it could be you bundle uh, the product with existing product. It could be a tier product, you know, like brown, silver, gold offering. It could be completely um, substitute or cannibalize existing or their products. Right? So those kind of detailed discussion uh, framing it and driving it with your uh, technical partner is another example how you zoom in, right? Rather than you kind of on the deal, just worry about uh, transactions. Right? You also have the zooming in on the detail deal thesis, making sure that uh, uh, a good alignment between the deal thesis and the transactions. All right, now I'm going to mess with you. So we have a timeline of the deal. And I'll use this scenario as an example because I want to get a sense of pre-LOI to the level that I, I would zoom into. And then how does that progress post-LOI when we get into confirmatory diligence? And using this as an example where a lot of this is around shaping the go-to-market and what that's going to look like with the product. Yeah, like what's that details and conversations early and then how does it progress? Yes. No, that, that's very good. Very good questions, right? So pre-LOI, I would say you should be able to zoom in to some level. Let's keep on the on the discussion on the product side, right? You should be able to zoom in 
up to the level such as product demo. So you can see the product in person if it is hardware. So, or the demo <laughs> during the pandemic, I think the demo of software can be done via Zoom. So you have your technical person, you can see the demo. Uh, is this is this something that we're interested, interested in, or this is totally different than inc incompatible with our core offerings? So, now, obviously, post LOI, um, you could see sort of the um, spaghetti detail of the code of the software. So you can see more due diligence, uh, how is the code is being written, so, uh, things like that, so, and see how compatible to uh, uh, our offerings. So, and then you start working on, wait, if you're gonna combine this product, so, the GUI or the interface itself is completely different than us, then how are you going to handle this? On the background, while you're doing the transaction, you're also driving a discussion with there will be some technical work need to be done here to at least adjust certain things, right? an example. And naturally, you also start thinking, therefore, wait, there has to be some integration at least. If they're going to work together, at least they should be able to access the SharePoint, those kind of stuff. Hence the discussion on the IT side. Right? So you have all this zooming in discussion, you know, is that, even though is that you're around, running transactions. Right? Is that mainly around identifying capital expenditures and then trying to maybe dial in your your synergies uh, or synergy uh, estimates? Uh, to some degree that, I think more importantly is to validate your Pre preliminary deal thesis and integration strategies, right? So obviously when you pitch the idea, personally, my personal preference to have a preliminary integration plans. Right? So that based on the deal thesis, here's what we think the integration plan is. Right? And then you have to validate that, right? both the deal thesis and the plans right? throughout the due diligence, right? While you're also driving the transaction with the, um, the other sides. Can you give me ex examples? Like, how, how does that pan out? Because I, I like where you're thinking about it. The big common fallacy here about m and playing the integration late. So it sounds like you're validating these things really early, clicking down and getting a sense of how it's going to come together. Um, but then when you move into signing LOI and confirmatory diligence, how does that unfold with getting all those details for having a, the right integration plan? I just, and some people think there's a magic template for this stuff, which I like how you started with, you can get some structure based on the strategy of integration to start with. But yeah, I'm curious of the details and how things shape from there. Like you mentioned, sir, I think time's also the essence on the transactions. Right? Um, I would say um, when you go through kick off the diligence process, uh, this is assuming you already in, uh, involve uh, the integration leads. So you want to kind of frame what are the most important part in terms of driving the due, due diligence. So this diligence process can go all over the places, right? So as a deal leads, you have to frame it and focus the team on the few items that are relevant to the deal thesis. Okay. Could be a product strategy, okay? Could be uh, other synergies, right? I mean, if you look at the p and it's pretty much at the top of the line, bottom of the line, or financial or tax synergies, right? Obviously, top of the line is the product strategy, uh, bottom of the line could be uh, cost saving, those kind of stuff, right? You, you have to help them focus in terms of what important on the deal this is. On top of the typical sort of backend office uh, diligence going into integrations, right? um, you have to drive them, uh, I would say, given majority of your eminent team, most likely is not a full-timer. Right? So you have to help them focus in terms of where do you want to uh, uh, the the diligence going uh, for an exit at thirty to sixty days? Right? Uh, let me just pause there. 
Are these the same people you're having conversations with on diligence about integrating it? Uh, is that happen at the same time? Are they completely different people? Does it get staged later in the deal? I was trying to get into that piece where, you know, how, how you're sort of doing both at the same time, the diligence and the integration planning. This is very uh, company to company, even organization, even with a large corporation with multiple views, uh, multiple business unit. My personal preference, I would like to have most, if not all, the diligence team become the integration teams. Right? But in reality, that's not always the case right? because resources within the corporations. Right? At least you have majority of the diligence team become the integration teams. Right? So they will own what they discover and how they will translate that to the integrations. Right? Could you rephrase, could you also phrase that as the integration team owning diligence? Correct. Okay, I just want to make sure because I, I yep. feel like I have more conversations with the integration side that advocates to be involved earlier. In fact, do the diligence. Correct. So my personal press, uh, preference that way, sorry. But in the bigger, uh, large corporation, I would say sometimes it's not possible because the fungible of resources. Sometimes they get pulled to a different yeah. deal or different projects, right? Um, yeah. Why is it better? I would say one thing is uh, avoid the disconnect side. Right? When you when the diligence team just own it, the diligence and then hand it over to the integration, a different integration lead, there is always a disconnect side right? um, in terms of uh, what they learn, what they discover, things like that. Right? Plus, if you if you did the diligence and you did the integration, you cannot have that ownership, right? I did assess that risk as a medium to low risk. Now I need to figure out how do I mitigate this risk during the integration. Right? So if there is a disconnect, with, if there are two people between diligence and integration, right, um, the risk assessment and the mitigation execution could be off. Right? What are the negative consequences of that? I would say, it will take longer uh, efficiency, right? not just efficiency. It could also um, uh, hinder some of the um, deal thesis synergies. Right? I mean, as simple as what I just mentioned to you regarding the uh, product strategies. Right? If the if the IT uh, is not aware of the 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 expectation of integration, if people don't have the appropriate uh, working laptop and stuff, it may hinder uh, uh, how quickly can you integrate a product, for example. So if there is a disconnect between what we learn in, in diligence, what we plan, and then a completely new different guy executing the integrations, uh, it could delay uh, some of the execution, hence affecting the deal thesis. So slower value capture on one end and then potentially missing out synergies completely. Correct. Sorry. I'm curious because I have these conversations and I'm one is trying to back everybody's uh, blames integration for deal failure. Right. Yeah. And uh, there's good points on that. But within the whole process and you think of value leak, I feel like this is probably one of the biggest value leaks that you could have. I don't, I don't know if that's the case or if you think there's something bigger. So <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that because Ryan, uh, because I'm the deal leads, right? but I, I did some integration in the past, so I can see the importance of the integration. So I'm well aware of that. Uh, that's what I would say make uh, my execution is a bit different. Right? You could argue, uh, some people on the front end always argue the transaction is the, the biggest value. Some people on integration may argue integration is the biggest value because that's what the value creation post deal. So in my opinion, all is critical, but I know that integration is hard uh, from my experience in the past. Therefore, I'm well aware of that, trying to make sure that my integration team is uh, uh, well aligned as early as possible. Uh, this knowledge chasm stuff, any big things you've learned to overcome that? So I would say maybe, I don't know how applicable to other industries, right? Because we are in the high tech. 
where um, technical know-how somewhat more important. Sorry. So identifying the integration lead is not may, may be slightly more difficult than other industries. Right? Some big corporation, you may have a very robust IMO. Sorry. Their job is basically project management. Okay. In the tech world, you need to figure out, do I need someone that actually know about the product, the technical detail about the software or the hardware? Okay. Do I want to put two people in the box, both the PM and the technical uh, PM? Sorry. Do I want the technical PM become the integration leads? So what I'm trying to say is that identifying the appropriate technical lead is critical, I think, in the success of the post-deal uh, uh, value creation. We're touching on some good stuff here. Like These aren't the, the easiest things to overcome. But uh, I, I do like these examples of getting to these specific details that really trail around how you're prioritizing the value drivers of the deal. And that sort of gives you guidance on where you should emphasize your attention and make sure you're getting into those details in the area that's potentially be the biggest risk or biggest things to screw up down the road. Sure. Um, when you talked earlier, we talked about the frameworks and my takeaway there was there's a lot of problems to solve and decisions to make and that establishing a framework so you can do both quickly is probably one of the engineering critical areas to focus on in m a can you walk me through what those frameworks look like i would say uh, at least my personal framework uh, in terms of uh, uh, driving a problem to some sort of conclusion so generally i would say listen uh, synthesize okay um, I would say formulate and then converge. Right? What I mean by that is you listen to what your stakeholder just learned, right? Um, either toward during the target engagement or due diligence, right? Okay. You need to synthesize, help them synthesize what does it mean. So right? then you have to help them frame with given all this situation you just discover. What do you have in mind in terms of option to handle this? Keep in mind, um, your colleague is the expert in the given fields, right? either in the technical or in the finance or in the uh, IT. Right? They, they probably already have some sort of initial thought how to handle this. Right? So you kind of help them to, uh, to formulate the option, right? how to handle this. And understand the also uh, assess the uncertainties. Right? Okay. Then you're gonna have to converge them and the management in terms of how we should make a decision around this. So, so I would say, yeah, listen, synthesize, framing, and converging. That's kind of uh, uh, my formula in terms of day to day basis. I uh, I like this. I want to go one more time. So it's listening, synthesizing, and then. Framing and uh, uh, converging. Framing, converging. Um, when you say what's on your mind, that one refers to framing. Can yes. Really understand. So oftentimes you you listen to what they discover. So it help them shape what is their initial thought. Frame them in term in term of what option uh, do we have to handle these situations. Right? Usually, given their expertise, they already have some initial thoughts, right? You kind of have to uh, help them guide, hey, what exactly the options are. Right? Yep. And with the uncertainty, uh, with the given options. And then converge. Yeah, so in any given any given problem with uh, a few options to choose, we actually have to converge right? in terms of what is the recommendation what do we want uh, the management to approve? Sorry. Is there anything around like feedback or, you, you know, sometimes you got to course correct or redact and try something different? Do, does, does that a step in there? How, how do you get that feedback loop? So this is where the, I would say, 
a combination of bottom up and top down zone. Okay. So it, you actually have consistent dialogue with them. Um, I would say per, my personal preference is to have somewhat consistent dialogue with the upper management zone. Obviously from the bottom up, you'll probably have one-on-one -on -one meeting with uh, um, some of your uh, colleagues. Right? You have smaller discussion uh, for specific issues right? that actually involve multiple stakeholders. And you have a team meeting right? where you um, making sure it map, hey, we discovered this, this will impact A, B, C, D, E. Right? Okay. So one-on-one, -on -one, smaller group, team meeting, and then you have a consistent discussion with the management side, either you know a milestone or decision making meetings. Hence, you get hoping to get the feedback for a top down uh, guidance. So this thing is a loop, right? Uh, it's constantly a loop throughout the deal formation and the deal execution. Um, those kind of stages in the M and A side, and I'm sure in the integration is the same thing too. Is there any language or approach you use to make sure you're getting that information? Do you encourage it? How do you get the feedback? My personal take on, based on my experience, given the large corporation, you have multiple business unit, multiple general managers. Right? First, you need to understand the, the style of each different uh, uh, sort of uh, upper management, sorry. and my big aim is that you need to make sure that you're going into the meeting is clear what you want to get out of it. Okay, minimum number of slide. Basically, here's the situation. Here's the option that we are considering. What what do you guys have in mind? Sorry. What do you guys think we should do? Sorry. Therefore, it's clear going in and out, we will get some input, either decision or input or an action item. There are different approach to this. Some people like an open discussion and dialogue. Right? So the discussion could be all over the place. You, know? you will give you will give times for people to discuss an open dialogue, but you actually have to own the meeting and frame it so that you reach some sort of a conclusion or some sort of feedback. So. So having the right framing going into the meeting and know what you want out of the meeting, I think it's important to get the feedback. Keep in mind, right? Majority of this uh, upper management or execs, right? They have, I don't know, 10 to 15 meetings any given day, sir. Right? Yeah, uh, yeah. And MNA could be just one of them, sir. Right? Okay. <laughs> so you need to frame it Hey, we spoke with you last time. Here's what we learned. Here's the option. What do you think? Yeah, recap everything. Have good documentation. These uh, framework, the listen, synthesize, framing, converge. Is that something you're very formal and transparent about? And you address that broadly as you work through a deal? Or is that more of a culture thing and way of doing it? I would say it's more like a culture thing for myself uh, to be more disciplined in the uh, driving the meetings. Right? Uh, it's not like a formalized, hey, you have to spend certain minutes on this, certain minutes on that. Right? It's like in, in the back of your mind, you always have to think that way uh, to structure it so that it'll become a meaningful meeting. Right? And then it's just an open where everyone branching to multiple places, right? You have to kind of uh, uh, have them focus. Hey, let's get back to where we are here now. We have a situation. We think here's the option. So uh, there are maybe maybe there are other more options. We can discuss it. But toward the end, where do we leaning to, or do we need more information before we can make any decisions? Right? Well, I, I, I mean, I'm, all these decisions. There are many many decisions before the deal can convert. Right. Uh, if you don't, what happens is that any problem will overlap another problem, will overlap another problem. You will never get to uh, the end goal of it. So you just have to be efficient in terms of uh, uh, solving problem 
one at a time or consecutively. There should be some, when I think of your M&A function, I think of like broadly this growing M&A team as you do the deal that you should communicate some way of, of the approach as a broader team of how we're going to approach like the framework you described. So I feel like it should be taught. You know, it's one thing to have it cultural, but it, it's organization to organization. They don't think about it that way. They don't put an emphasis in consciously think, how do we optimize for the speed of problem solving decision making? And that's, that's where it's interesting where your view, you've done it and sort of have the, the DNA around it. But yeah, I'm just curious if I, a good practice wouldn't be to teach it and say, hey, here's your little boot camp and participating in this M&A deal will give you a high level of how we think about it. Or is that just broader DNA of the company that they're already doing it culturally that way? Keep in mind, my experience mostly in the large corporations, right? I'm not sure if you're familiar in the large corporation, even within different business unit, I would call there is subculture. So mm -hmm. that's keep in mind. So I, a business should be could be in the billions or multi billion dollars. Right? So one approach may not be applicable. One approach to certain division or business unit may be not applicable to another business unit. So right? bigger corporation tend to have uh, established um, M and A team established IMO, they may have a good uh, established processes, framework. So. But at the same time, you have to be flexible when you're partnering with different uh, business unit or different general manager or different uh, stakeholders. So you actually have to be adjusting as well. The only thing that you could be disciplined on your own is the framework of your own in terms of driving a solution. So. Hmm. Now, some people don't like, it, it depends, right? Some people don't like processes. So they don't like to be told processes. Some people like processes, okay? But I would say as an m and lead, you will have to have that framework, regardless whether it was stated or not stated, you have to drive them so, in order to solve it. So. That's a really good view on it. You have to deal with a lot of different personalities and you can't expect them to change dramatically. Exactly. Because the goal is not, I would say, the goal is not everyone to follow your process. The goal is how do we get it done by solving all these uh, 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 challenges between deal formulation to the closing, right? You respect what the process is. Right? Yeah, you want to work well together with them. Yep. Do you, um, is there a balancing act between doing that, working with this business unit internally and then with the target company that you're heavily involved with or are you sort of more shepherding conversations between the two? It's definitely a balancing act. So in essence, um, you have... Uh, um, the acquiring business unit, trying to make a decision by learning as much as possible. So, and the other hand is um, trying to get the transaction um, uh, um, as robust as possible. So, I think you have the balancing act. Uh, how do you drive the transaction? And how do you learn as much as possible that you make the right decisions? Okay. Now, I would say in any learning throughout during the target engagement pre LOI and the diligence um, uh, toward closing, right? you may encounter, I would say that under, you could put it under three buckets, right? There are things that you could learn as much as possible and then the problem solved by itself after knowing all this information, right? okay? That's bucket number one, is easy, right? It's not, it, it's not I, won't, I won't call it easy, it's more like once you learn, 
technically you don't make decisions, right? The, the problem solves itself. Ah, it becomes clear that we need to do the following. Yeah. But more often than not, there is no perfect or complete solutions, right? Okay. Then you just have to understand what the risk is okay? and then have a mitigation plan either before or post close. Yeah. And of course, there's the third bucket that could be what I call the showstoppers, right? That, that there's nothing you can do about it. As you're driving that balancing X, right? You're trying to assess all this on the on the on the on the business side, sorry. Right? And you also have to work with the other side to accommodate uh, some of these learnings, right? We can we can go through the transactions. Uh, oh, so the third one, you still get the deal done. Exactly. So it's just it gonna take a lot more effort than anything else. Yep. I mean, that's a good sense of sizing these issues and knowing how to respond accordingly. When when you're going through this deal, and it, it sounds like this balancing act of how, when, and the depth that you participate on, how does that shape on the expectation of who has ownership of the decisions to make and problems to solve? You know, do you have to communicate that or is that people just know, like, when does it, some of these things really become not your problem and it's on the business? So in terms of ownership, right, generally it's good to, to have a clear ownership to drive accountability right? in a way that it make it clear on, for example, in the diligence kickoff, who are the owner of a given function, right? it's clear the expectation. And then whenever there is a inter-functional problem, you have to identify uh, uh, who, who should make the calls. Right? I would say making it clear on the ownership, it does help in terms of driving the accountability, the driving uh, uh, a problem to be a, a uh, quickly solved, sorry. Right? What you don't want is basically there is a problem that requires multiple function. It's not clear who's supposed to drive that. So my personal preference is not to to put multiple people in under one box or having one person to report to multiple people. So it creates a conflict of interest, sorry. not incentivizing them to the right direction. That, but that's just my personal preference. So just having a single responsible owner or person to report to and avoiding yep. any duplicate? Even if it is in um, multiple functional need to handle certain challenges, right? It's clear, hey, hey you kind of lead this way. The other functional group help you with that. So clear. Because what happened is that if you have multiple equal uh, lead under the same box or uh, owning the same thing, it could create a tension, uh, lack of ownership, this kind of stuff. So, so to, to zoom out uh, on that, if I was broadly looking at that approach we talked earlier, uh, listening, synthesize, framing, converge in problem solving. So thinking back on the that broad approach of encouraging the team and their approach on decision making and problem solving, um, how, how do you know when there's just too many cooks in the kitchen? I don't know if that's a consideration that, all right, we have like 12 people wait, weighing in on this decision. You know, is that something you th think about or would just generally limit Whenever there's a project, even outside m and right? uh, m and is one of the, I would say, one of the good example that a project can have, I would say, 20 to even 50 team members. Right? It's not unheard of. You could have too many cooks in the kitchens. Right? That's why I think you will have this level of meeting, the one-on-one, -on -one, smaller group meeting, and the team meetings. Right? Any any uh, challenge or problem as the deal lead 
you need to be able to drive that in the smaller meetings yep. uh, to have them converge. Like I say, if you if you keep trying to address some of the problem in the larger meetings, it will sometimes it will never converge because of there are too many cooks in the kitchen. So you can address that by having a smaller meeting and even down to the one-on-one -on -one meetings so to make sure it's clear. Here's the framing how to solve it. And you're the owner on the driving this. So in some ways you have to be proactive to limit the cooks in the kitchen. You sort of take this decision, isolate it a bit and put the- Yeah, right so you've probably heard this many times, right? In the, m and so even though in the bigger cooperation with well-established team, from what I, from my experience that majority of your resources is a, not a full-time m and so. And then it's your job to um, drive this, align them, have them uh, drive to conclusion. Because m and activity may not be their top priority. They have other jobs. Mm -hmm. So you have to drive them, you have to set them uh, set them aside in smaller group discussions, right? Um, to become clear in terms of ownership that way. That makes sense. So you, you do have to do that to keep decisions and problems solving moving along, to keep decision-making and problem solving moving along fast. Right. Andy, we haven't even touched our interview outline. Um, you know, if you get the chance, let's find some time and actually pick up the interview that we're supposed to have. Thank you so much for the time and conversation today. I enjoyed, I learned a lot. I, you've helped me become a better m and scientist. Those of you still with us, thank you. And here's to the deal. All right. Thank you for having me.